And we're live. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our special story time with Anna Lugzowski and Steph Lab uh, Labaris. Sorry, I mispronounced your name right right there for, oh, for a second. All right. Uh, but today we are presenting their picture book, T-Rexes Can't Tie Their Shoes. Uh, before we begin, I have some short announcements. Uh, please consider supporting our bookstore by purchasing a copy of today's featured book. Um, we um, are the oldest independent bookstore in Southern California. We are 127 years old. So uh, it's so we're really grateful for any kind of support you can give us today. Also, we have time for audience questions at the uh, end of the event or even during the event. So if you have any questions, please send them by using the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so let me introduce our guests and then we can get started. So. Anna Lazowski is an award-winning senior producer at CBC Radio based in Winnipeg. She has an MA in journalism from the University of Western Ontario and a BFA degrees from University of Manitoba. T-Rexes Can't Tie Their Shoes is her first book. Congratulations. And uh, we have Steph Labaris, who graduated from Rhode Island School of Design. She creates art for children's products and books, including the Grumpy Cat books for Little Golden Books, My Little Golden Book about sharks, and My Little Golden Book about dinosaurs. Lots of animals there. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn my camera off and we're going to get started with story time. Enjoy, everyone. Hi, everybody. So we're going to be reading through this brand new book that Steph and I put together, T-Rexes Can't Tie Their Shoes. Um, so it's all about things that kids can do and animals can't do. So that if you're trying to learn something new and it's taking a little bit longer to get the hang of it, you can flip through this book and see that animals can sometimes have an even bigger challenge at accomplishing things than kids. Steph, did you want to say anything else? I think you said Before it all. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna share the images, hopefully. Okay, can you see that? No. No. Hmm. Was it share window? You should still be able to do it through a uh, entire screen. Oh. I mean entire screen. Yeah. Give us a moment nice. folks, all right. Yeah, I don't think so you could open the file. There it we go. Is open. Now you're seeing it? Yeah, now we can see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll just switch it back to this one. How's that? That's good. Let's see if I can put the full screen. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Sorry, everyone. Okay, here we go. So T Rexes can't tie their shoes. These are the lovely end papers that Steph created. If you're still a bit small, it is no fun at all when you can't reach a shelf or get dressed by yourself. But you're not alone, my dear friend, it is true. Some things are hard for animals too. A hopscotching horse or kung fu kangaroo, there are lots of things animals just cannot do. Alligators can't pick apples. Bees can't ride bicycles. Cheetahs can't chew bubble gum. Dogs can't do dishes. Elephants can't fit in elevators. Foxes can't flip pancakes. Giraffes can't do gymnastics. Horses can't play hopscotch. Iguanas can't eat ice cream. Jaguars can't do jumping jacks. Kangaroos can't practice kung fu. Llamas can't play leapfrog. 
Monkeys can't do magic tricks. Narwhals can't eat nachos. Owls can't fold origami. Penguins can't play ping pong. Quetzals can't keep quiet. Raccoons can't ride roller coasters. Seahorses can't sing. T-Rexes can't tie their shoes. Urchins can't open umbrellas. Vampire bats can't vacuum. Walruses can't make waffles. Xenopses can't play xylophones. Yaks can't throw yo-yos. Zebras can't go zip lining. but they can have a lot of fun trying. Then at the end of the book, we've learned all about the things that all of these animals can't do. But at the end of the book, there's two pages of a little fact about every animal about things that they can do. So I'm just gonna pick a couple and read them to you. So elephants, elephants can't fit in elevators, but elephants can make their own sunscreen. Elephants use their trunks to cover their skin with sand and mud to avoid sunburns. So that's one. Iguanas can grow a new tail. If an iguana's tail is grabbed or injured, it can release that tail and grow a new one. Seahorses can help build robots. Seahorses use their long tails to grab onto things. Robotics engineers have studied them to improve their own ideas for building mechanical parts. And this one's super cool. Zebras can be scanned like a barcode. Every zebra has a stripe pattern that is unique. Scientists can use software to scan the stripes and identify each zebra in a herd. So at the end of the book, there's a bunch of other really cool facts about animals that you can browse through as well. And then we have these lovely pages again. Woohoo! <laughs> and that is the book. So we thought what we would do is go back and talk specifically about a couple of the pages. So Steph, did you want to talk about maybe how you cut, came up with one of the images that you drew? Sure, so when I was coming up with pretty much all the illustrations for the book, um, I tried to think about in each situation what kind of animal was involved and what are things that are special to that animal? Like what you know qualities does that animal have or what kind of limitations do they might have that might make their situation funny? So in the case of the dog doing the dishes, you know, it's it's a pretty open statement. Dogs can't do dishes. But I thought, OK, why couldn't a dog do dishes? Well, dogs don't have thumbs. So if they're trying to wear dish gloves, that wouldn't really work out. And they can't really hold things. So we're going to put the bottle of detergent in his mouth. And I don't think he's got a lot of control over that. So the soap would be just kind of spilling out uncontrollably. And for the breed of dog, um, I wanted it to be a breed that kind of doesn't know how to be a dog also. I mean, no offense to pug owners. I love pugs. They're very sweet and they're very snorty. Um, but it's really hard to imagine them as, you know, their ancestor, the wolf, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So I figured a pug would just be funny and I could do the eyes going in different directions. And it just, that one just kind of came together really quickly. So I like my dog doing dishes. <laughs> Or trying at least. Trying, yeah. I think another favorite that we have in common is N for Narwhal. I think when I saw this one, like I legitimately laughed out loud because, I mean, 
you can see like this is an impossible task for the T-Rex to tie his shoes because his arms are never going to reach those laces no matter what he does. Um, and this guy's kind of running into the same problem in that he's piercing his nachos and they're nowhere near his mouth. They're not really built for nachos. And it was no. it was the same process for me. I'm like, okay, it's a narwhal. What's special about a narwhal? Well, they have that one tusk that looks like a giant like unicorn horn. So we're gonna we're gonna work with that. And I'm like, okay, do nachos lend themselves to having a horn? No. I mean, I don't think you could actually even, you know, put nachos on a horn like that because they'd probably crack and break. But I figured, you know. His, his horn's going to, or his tusk is going to work against him here. So, you know, by putting the nachos on the tusk, he can't quite reach it. He's got those little flippers that don't quite do what they're supposed to do. And I tried to make sure that all of the pieces of the nachos that were falling off weren't falling into his mouth because he, he can't eat nachos. And then they'd just be wet in the water, which wouldn't be very delicious either. No one likes soggy nachos. No. And I think there was also... Um... Another one that uh, felt a great kinship with was the yak <laughs> trying to um, do yo-yo tricks. Because I think uh, we can all sort of relate to that when you try to throw a yo-yo and try to do a trick and it just kind of ties itself in knots. And yeah. I wound up with a lot of bruises trying to learn how to throw yo-yos. Uh -huh. <laughs> it never, never worked yeah. out for me. And this was another early favorite of mine and stuff. So did you want to talk about the bee? Yes, this was a very special spread for both of us, as it turns out. So um, again, trying to figure out how a bee can't ride a bicycle. Well, there's there's a, a size issue there. You know, a, bee's, a bee is not going to reach any functional part of the bike to make it go forward. It's not going to reach the pedals. It's not going to reach the handlebars. You know, so this this poor bee is just accepting his fate. But when I illustrated the bike, I wanted to make a bike that I would want to have or I would want to ride. And I always wanted one of those beautiful mint green, like, you know, beach cruiser type bikes. So that's what I drew. And then I found out later through Anna that it is not only her favorite bike, but it is actually her own bike. Which she will show you a picture. picture. But I can't find the picture. Okay, sadly, I won't be able to show you that picture. Just so. take our word for it. She has a beautiful mint green bike and I want it. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny to open it and see my bike staring back at me with a little bee sitting on it, which I found quite hilarious. And it was just one of those moments because when Steph was working on all the illustrations, I didn't see them until she was done. So then it's kind of like flipping through this book and finding these little moments that you kind of aren't expecting right down to the there's an iguana page the iguana who can't eat ice cream so steph drew without ever having talked to me about anything or even met me anyway <laughs> she drew this iguanas can't eat ice cream page with mint chocolate chip ice cream which is like one of the ice cream flavors that we always have in our house that my kids also really like um so that was also kind of funny. So I pulled up, this is cheating, but I've pulled up a picture of my bike on the phone. So you there can we see go. It. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's face it, mint green is the best color and it's also the best flavor. So yeah, <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about this back double page spread? Because this one you've said has take took the longest because in this back back page double spread where all the animals are trying their hardest to work together to help each other achieve their goals and challenges to varying degrees of success. How did you go about planning something this detailed? Yeah, this this back spread was um, sort of the grand finale of the book. And I wanted to really kind of take my time on it and be careful um, about who was doing what. So um, the original idea for the last part of the book was that it would be kind of all the animals, you know, still still failing at the things they were trying to do, but just having a good old time of it. But I wanted to try a different approach where um, there's kind of mixed success going on. Um, some of the animals have succeeded at their tasks, but with the help of other animals who, you know, kind of use their abilities to, to, you know, help the other animals in a better way. So um, the first thing I did was try to figure out, okay, 
which animals have similar problems or, or things that they're trying to do. So for example, um, the walrus making waffles, you know, he can't do that, but maybe the fox who was trying to flip pancakes, maybe he can help the walrus. So he teams up with the walrus and they make their waffles and the pug who was doing the dishes can supply, you know, the dishware <laughs> for serving the waffles, you know? And I just, I just tried to find links where, you know, these animals could kind of come together and maybe they can't do everything that they've tried, but you know, when they get together, they can get some stuff done. Or like the monkey, for example, tying the T-Rex's shoes. The monkey's the only one that's got thumbs. So he's <laughs> clearly got the advantage here. So there's probably more stuff he can do. He's going to be very popular. Yes. With all of these folks trying to figure them out. <laughs> <laughs> Get all these tasks accomplished. Uh, okay, there. I'm just going to open up the question box. All right. Let's see what we've got in here. So what's the hardest part of drawing a T-Rex? Or are there more difficult animals to draw? You drew a lot of animals in this book. I did, I did. And that, that's an excellent question. Um, the hardest part of drawing a T-Rex, you know, I think the hardest part was the fact that we don't have any photographs of T-Rexes as reference. Um, whenever I draw animals, I always look up reference photos. So even though my art style is very cartoony, um, I have to look at photo reference to know what the original animal looks like. Cause you know, if, if I'm drawing a horse, for example, um, and I want to exaggerate certain parts of the horse, like the, the nose or the hooves or, or whatever, hello, Mr. X. Um, you need to know what the original animal looks like so that you know which parts of the animal to kind of exaggerate or draw attention to, because you'd be surprised if you're drawing a horse and you exaggerate the wrong part and no longer it looks like a horse anymore. You know, so going back to the T-Rex is not having photo reference was tricky because um, since most of the reference we have is either skeletal, which is helpful, um, or it's other artist illustrations of what we think a T-Rex looked like and you know, that concept is always changing, you know, did they have feathers? Did they not have feathers? How did they stand? You know, back when I was a kid, we thought that T-Rexes stood like Godzilla and they were vertical with their little arms hanging down. But now we realize that they were mostly horizontal and how they moved, you know? So um, the T-Rex took a lot of imagination, but I also needed to make sure that I was pulling enough reference from sources that he was still recognizable as a t-rex if that makes sense and you went with orange i did i did i went with orange because it looks good against purple yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> i i'm not sure what the prevailing theory is on the color of t-rexes right now some people say they were more natural colored like browns and and tans and some people say no they had flashes of color for you know um you know finding uh partners and mates or whatever but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not really sure where we stand on that. <laughs> uh, okay, our next question is talk about the process working together. Do you want to explain how that works, Steph? Yeah, so we didn't work together, if you can believe it. Um, a lot of times, or most times in publishing, at least from my experience, the artist and the author don't have direct, direct contact. Uh, I worked through an art director uh, through the publisher, who, of course, was in touch with Anna, you know, the author throughout. Um, but we we really didn't start to see, you know, all of these these coincidences and overlap like the bike or, or the mint chip ice cream until after the artwork was done. And Anna was like, oh, hey, this this is my bike. This is my favorite flavor of ice cream. And then we kind of struck up a casual conversation on Twitter after that and just became friends, you know, just after the fact and realized that we're kind of two peas in the, in the pod. Um, but no, a, a lot of people don't know that in publishing, you know, the artist and the author, unless you are the same person are pretty separate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's too, because um, they look at picture books as sort of a 50, 50 split of, of efforts, right? So if one person does the writing, one person does the illustration, but Steph has an art, artistic background and creative mind, and that way she or whoever's doing the illustrations can bring their own visions to the book. And often, like with this book, brought things I never would have thought of, um, which elevates it and just kind of makes it that much more fun, especially for the authors <laughs> to go back and read. 
<laughs> so that was kind of a nice surprise too. So it, yeah, I, mean, I think probably it seems strange to a lot of people to know that the authors and the illustrators aren't working together on the books, but I think that leads to some really interesting collaborative elements. I also imagine you must be on pins and needles while you're waiting for artwork to come in, you know, because mm -hmm. the authors don't really get to choose their artists either, do they? Uh, not usually. I think there can, there can be input, but mm -hmm. uh, it's funny when I think when our editor, Frances, bought this book, she told me she'd been waiting to work with you for a long time. And this was, I guess when she read it, she was like, finally, I have the project. So it worked out very well for, for both of us, too, that she'd just been kind of waiting for the right moment to to reach out to you. That's amazing. And I, I took the project immediately. I read I read the manuscript and was like, I want it. This is this is it. <laughs> okay. Were there any animals that didn't make it into the book? Oh, we have a good story for this one. We well, have a yeah, story. there were there were some and even just some of the things that they were doing changed, I think. At first, the alligator, one of them was the alligators can't do arithmetic. But then we decided the goal of the book was to make sure that whatever the animals couldn't do were things that kids could do. And, you know, you learn math at different stages. So it had to be something that kids could also feel confident that was something that they could accomplish. So alligators changed to alligators can't pick apples. But then um, do you want to talk about your secret drawing? Yes. So I found out you know, after the fact, you know, well, we have been doing interviews now that the book has been published, uh, like written interviews where we just answer questions, send them in and, and they get published. Um, so I was reading an interview um, and I was reading Anna's answers to this interview. And she mentioned that there was um, an animal that didn't make it into the book. And it was um, sloths can't eat soup. And I'm like, oh, that, I mean, I love the seahorse that can't sing. Don't get me wrong. But I'm like, that's that's a really cool scenario. Like I, I, I kind of wish that could happen. So literally days ago, I, I messaged Anna and I was like, I want to do the sloth that can't eat soup. So we have a bonus spread, a, a lost illustration, if you will. This is not in the book, um, but it needed to exist um, of the sloth who cannot eat soup. Can you see it? I'm going to try to share it. Cannot see. Okay, one sec. Saw him for a minute there. Did you? Okay. Yeah, hang on. There it is. Can you go full screen? Uh, maybe. No, nah, it's as good as I can do. Can you see him? We can. So, again, thinking about my process for the sloth that can't eat soup, um, first thing I thought of is, okay, what are things that define a sloth? Well, we know they're slow and I'm like, okay, he's slow and he can't eat soup maybe because his soup gets cold, but cold soup isn't really a funny visual. So then I was like, okay, sloths hang upside down. Soup and gravity is funny. So I envisioned a sloth hanging from a vine and sloths have those long claws that they use to climb trees. So you're not going to be able to grip a porcelain bowl with these long fingery claws. So I figured he'd be bumbling with a bowl of soup, of course, falling right on his face. And when I was um, speaking with Anna about this, when we were collaborating, I was like, you know, oh, what kind of soup is funny, you know? And she's like, well, alphabet soup. And I'm like, oh, of course, I mean, <laughs> alphabet soup for an alphabet book. So um, there are a couple of hidden words in this fiasco. Um, the most clear one is on the slot's head of his current situation. Oops. Um, and now that I'm looking at it, I realized that I forgot to illustrate the spoon. So let's just assume that the spoon has fallen out of frame. <laughs> um, but that is a sloth who cannot eat his soup. Yeah, super cute. Love that one. Do you have any pets? So I don't know if you can hear in the background, I have a little dog sitting beside me snoring. <laughs> He's sort of a uh, Shih Tzu and a Brussels Griffin cross. So he kind of looks like an Ewok a little bit. And Steph also has a pet sleeping next to her. I do. I'm going to disturb the peace. Wait a minute. Come here. Oh. 
this little goblin is Sprocket, and she just woke up, and now she's mad. <laughs> but we gotta do what we gotta do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have actually two cats. We have an older cat who stays mostly in the front of the house where the sunlight is. And um, up until a couple of years ago, I had many, 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 many pet rats. And I love rats as pets. They're wonderful and brilliant. I think I've had 23 rats in my lifetime. Um, I do want to have rats again someday. But because I have this one who um, doesn't get along with smaller things, if, if we allow the opportunity, which we do not, um, I think I'm going to have to take a rat hiatus for a while because, you know, one of the conditions of having pets is that everybody is safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, here's a good question. Annika wants to know if you'll write a book about things T-Rexes can do. That's a very good one. Ooh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I have to think about that. We'd have to do a lot more, a lot more research. What are some things that T Rexes can do? We know they can run fast. Well, let us consult the back of the book where we have one we could start with. <laughs> so T Rexes had the strongest bite of any land animal that has ever lived, and it had the longest teeth of any dinosaur. Its arms were too short to put food in its mouth, so it used its huge draw jaws to crunch on its prey. Yep, that sounds about right. That would be a pretty action-packed book. It would. It would, it would, it would. Let's see. What do you hope your young readers take away from the book? I think for me, it really is just that a lot of times, and I think we all do this, we want to be good at something right away. We want to try something and get it right the first time. We want to be able to do a cartwheel. We want to be able to tie our shoes. We want to be able to make a nice dinner or snack or peel an apple or whatever it is. And sometimes it takes practice. And sometimes you just have to keep trying. And I think that's okay. So I'm hoping that if kids see animals having trouble with things too, they'll feel a little better if they have to do a cartwheel a few times before they get their legs right up in the air because that can be a bit challenging too. I still can't do a cartwheel. I never could. Yeah. Not for lack of trying, just <laughs> you know, maybe I'm just not built for it. And maybe that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And to kind of add to that, I mean, um, what I want young readers to get from the book is I want them to laugh. I just want them to see these animals in ridiculous situations and just bust out laughing at their favorites and maybe they'll discover an animal they didn't know existed like maybe they've never seen narwhals before you know mm -hmm. maybe they don't know what a xenops is like i had to look that up yeah like this little guy is just trying to flip a pancake and oops fun fact that's my oven except my oven's not green it's the oven that is i it? want yeah we have an old westwood oven i, I like can't it, it. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Okay, how are we doing for questions? Why did we choose a T-Rex for the cover? Do you actually pick the cover? I know, I don't actually. No. No, I mean, the, the, the book came titled to me as T-Rexes can't tie yeah. their shoes. So I'm like, well, I know what's going on the cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it really kind of captures the the whole essence of the book. Like you can see that this is never ever gonna happen. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of times you can try and you can get better at things than you could accomplish, but unless he can become extraordinarily flexible and bend his foot right up to his head, he's never gonna get those laces tied. Velcro shoes. Yes. Probably. Or slip-ons, you know. Oh <laughs> yes, some slippers would be good. Yeah. Crocs for oh, the yes. dinosaur. Oh, the alligator should wear Crocs. <laughs> Uh, oh, favorite childhood book. Oh, man. Ooh. Do you have a favorite childhood book, Steph? I do. Uh, you know, I have several. Um, yeah. I'll just talk about the top three. Um, the Pokey Little Puppy. Classic little golden book. Um, there was a Sesame Street book when I was little called The Monster at the End of This Book. Mm. Um, and it was about Grover. I don't know if he's still on Sesame Street or not. Um, but Grover was having a panic attack throughout this book because he knew that there was a monster at the end of it. And Grover would do anything to prevent you from turning the page to get to the end of the story. And I won't give away the ending, but um, it's it's a classic. And if you have really young kids or no young kids, um, put this book in front of them. And then 
I think my all time favorite children's book is The Velveteen Rabbit. Um, it's a classic, it's sad. Um, but as a kid who grew up loving stuffed animals and loving animals too, you know, it just, it really resonated with me at a young age. And I still read it. I have several different illustrated versions of it. Um, beautiful, beautiful story, you know, beautiful book. I, I would love someday to do um, my own version of it. You know, it's just, it's a really good story. Yeah, it's hard to pick one. So I'm going to pick a couple too. So my number one, one that I immediately, when I started having kids, the first book I bought for the bookshelf was The Paper Bag Princess, which is all about a little girl deciding she's not going to marry this prince who fails to rescue her from a dragon and she rescues herself and then decides she's not going to marry him and she's just going to do what she wants. So that was pretty awesome. Um, another one is all of Dennis Lee's books of poems we had when I was a kid. So I bought a lot of those and my childhood versions just fell apart actually. So I just bought this new one <laughs> um, to have again. Uh, I read those with my kids because I find kids love rhyming and they love poetry. So sometimes it was like really calming to read those to my kids when they were small. And then I also love Maurice Sendak books. So yes. Where the Wild Things Are and In the Night Kitchen. Yes. Some, you know, really just kind of bizarre, strange worlds set up in, in kids books, which are really kind of fun to hang out in for a while. Good choice. Oh, one thing we had an especially hard time learning as a kid. Well, cartwheels yours. <laughs> no, cartwheels for sure. Um, penmanship. I, I never got good grades for my handwriting. Oops, my cat is leaving. Um, I never got good grades for my handwriting and I always got um, points taken off because I don't hold the pencil right. I hold the pencil like that. But now I'd like to say to my third grade teacher, look what I'm doing for a living and I still hold the pencil wrong. <laughs> There's always a way. Mine was cutting. I think I wasn't really good at scissors. Really? I guess it wasn't neat enough, maybe. But so now every time I have to cut something and I always think, oh, I wonder how this is going to go. I think I, I probably did get a little bit better at it, but I just, I guess I didn't really care how neat it was. I just wanted the thing cut out so I could do the next, yeah, the next yeah. thing, thing was. Some of the criteria they give children is just really strange, you know, when you think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're just about done with questions. Oh, we have another one from Mark. Annika wants to know what funny things a T-Rex might do. I think there's any number of them. I think there were a lot. Well, there's like, you've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's like little pictures of T-Rexes trying to do handstands. Ah. They're just kind of squashed on their head and their little arms are sort of flailing around. I, could I always picture them trying to make a bed and failing because the sheets can't stretch and they can't hold them with their tiny arms. Yep. Tickle fights, I think, would be hilariously challenging for T-Rexes. Playing piano. I mean, yeah kneading bread dough or doing any kind of baking, you know, mm -hmm. driving. <laughs> Most things really like even a book. Yeah. How are they going to, cause they, they be can't hard. hold it in front of their face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of under their chin. Yeah. 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 I think we could do just a whole book on T-Rexes, but I don't know if that's. We'll find a way. Yeah. Find a way. We'll find a way. Okay, I think we're pretty much out of questions. Oh, Bill said in the chat he loves that the dog has a giant pile of dishes to wash like he had a dinner party. <laughs> well, maybe it's the aftermath of this double page spread of them all. Yeah, after the wash party. After this. And you'll notice he's still happy about it. You know, he had a great time. He, he doesn't know how he's going to get it done, but boy, howdy, he's going to try, you know? Yeah. In my experience, dogs cleaned plates just by licking them. So maybe he <laughs> didn't try that particular strategy. He'll get there. All right. I think that's uh, pretty much all the questions that 
we received. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. I hope you guys had fun. I mean, the book was really funny, in my opinion. I love all of the animals. And um, if you would like to buy a copy, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. It'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. We also have signed book plates available. So if you would like one, just make sure to write signed book plate in the order comments so that we can send you one with your book. Also, if you came in late, don't worry, you can watch this talk again um, after the broadcast ends. And we'll also try to get it on YouTube. So we'll um, have that up in a couple of days. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Steph. It was so thank lovely you. having you both. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.